another baseball season has come and gone, and only a champion remains from this point forward. But even as one team pops open the bubbly, there were those that didn't even make it close. The rebuilding, the disappointing, and the painful. Let's go over them all. And let's make it blunt. This franchise has more important things to worry about. The narratives were forming big time this summer. The Orioles are a blatant tank job. They need to be punished for trying to game the system. Those multiple long losing streaks prove they don't care about winning. Here's my counter argument. Baltimore wasn't trying to tank this year, they just sucked. If they were tanking, they would have traded Trey Mancini. Possibly John Means and Cedric Mullins, but those are guys you can build a franchise around. People tend to ignore that the Orioles pitching was ashamedly terrible. Injuries wrecked the starting rotation, forcing a chorus of shitty young guys, shitty older guys, and burned out supernovas to eat innings. Matt Harvey had a regular starting game. That's how bad it was. Sure, they still have hope for the future, but this year was a serious step back. All they have to remember this year by is Chris Davis retiring after being all but told to fuck off. Don't worry, Baltimore. Davis may be gone, but his deferred payments will be the second coming of Bobby Bonilla Day. Just sadder. Enough talk from me. I think this sums up their season best. I slam my penis in the car door. You slam your penis in the car door. <laughs> We thought the Jays were going to make the postseason this year. The level of form they were riding deep into September. Them hitting like Ted Williams as a team in a month's time. The pitching rounding into form. Good lord, they were looking like a team that could go far. But then it's like they just ran out of gas. The Jays had a small stretch where they were playing 500 ball in late September and that's all it took. After the start they had, they needed to be perfect to get to the postseason. And sadly, they missed out by a game. What a fucking bummer. You just had to blow that final game, didn't you, Washington? Those early season injuries and bullpen woes did them in at the end. But even for the stinging result, Toronto should feel excited about their future. They evolved into legitimate contenders this season. Potency of their lineup, the reemergence of Robbie Ray, the talent throughout the roster? It's a damn good situation to be in. Just like heading back to Canada this season, you'll be back, Toronto. And this time, you know what you need to do. Get more bullpen arms. And try to resign Marcus Semyon and Robbie Ray. When their tenure as the Indians, Cleveland chose to pay homage to history. They were exiled from any sort of relevant baseball and forced to move to the fringes, where life is much harder. And screw all life tends to repeat itself. Time is a circle for the future Guardians. One where hitting woes continue to torment them. One where they are always a piece or two short from achieving greatness. One where ownership settles for being second best. This is a team that was no hit thrice this season. And those are only the official ones. The only bats doing anything worth a damn were Jose Ramirez and Franmil <laughs> Reyes when he was healthy. The rest were either traded or just bad. Starting pitching tried to hold on, but then got infected with injury by local settlers. Emmanuel Clay had an amazing season and is the closer of the future, but they'll need more. It's going to have to come from within, though. I don't trust Dolan to open his pockets and get them what they truly need. He got his stadium renovation from the city, and he's seemingly content with that. In the end, Cleveland is going to be like their new namesake. Obscure and something that no one gives a shit about outside of their city. Or is that the roller derby team trying to sue them for their name change? Don't think this season has me any less pessimistic about their hopes, but I will give credit for massively overachieving. One thing has me a bit perplexed, though. They struggled against bad teams, yet had decisive series victories against legitimate opponents very strange. The Tigers had some incredible emergencies. Akil Badu became a legitimate major leaguer. Jonathan Scope reverted to his incredible 2016 form. Spencer Turnbull had the first great moment for the team in years. Miggy got 500 home runs. And then... Abby Grossman? Heimer Candelario? Willie Peralta? That's a strange list of names. Goes to show what a good manager can do for a team. Saw an incredibly weak AL Central this year and pounced on the opportunity. What about next year? You can't trust some of these performances to be sustainable, but they do have more prospects in the way. Worst comes to worst, Cabrera will more than likely get hit number 3,000 next year to cement his legacy. And they did demote Dave Littlefield. Maybe there is hope here after all. I'll be interested to see what they do in the offseason. So how do you properly assess a team that had multiple personality disorder throughout the season? First form, the April Swoon. Would they make us all shit pants by having the best record in baseball? 
Next up, a retro mid-2000s slacker. Just loafing around and doing as little as possible by sliding back down to the basement in June. After that, the man fresh out of rehab looking to get his life together. Noticing that his life has fallen apart and seeking help for his losing addiction. And then, the average person. Just that. Around 500 to finish the year. Nothing special, but it's better than what they were. Despite Salvador Perez having a career year worthy of song, I wonder what the future can hold. They're in a state of flux. They have some players that may age out in the next few years, but they've got some incredible talents on the way. Counting the days to Bobby Witt Jr. It's all you can do if you're a Royals fan. Also hoping that the pitching gains consistency to allow them to remain competitive for more than a month. Then maybe, just maybe, Hunter Dozier can do something with the near unlimited at bats he gets. New Age tactics have wisened Minnesota to the tricks of memedom. Too long have they shat the bed in the postseason. So why not revolutionize the formula? The consecutive postseason loss record can't be added to if you don't come anywhere close to it. There were deep concerns about them headed back to April and May, but we thought no big deal. Byron Buxton was hitting like God himself. The only issue was that he got injured, along with a good chunk of the hitting core stagnating. Team pitching like the aging talents that they had for the most part regressed. In their final stage, they chose to sell off pieces in what was supposed to be a crucial year in their window. Old Sensei Nelson Cruz is gone and Jose Barrios fetched them a premium, but it feels like a symbolic end. Dead last in an insanely weak AL Central? You sure you still think you can go another round? With who they kept, they still believe they can, but you have to think an overhaul is coming soon. They do have prospects on the way, but we said that five years ago. It hasn't panned out. Nobody's going to take them seriously until they win a playoff game. It just concludes that the T's are stuck on a hamster wheel. It just can't win. Shohei Otani had a season of dreams in 2021. His generational abilities tantalized us in nearly every aspect of the game. This man was doing things that baseball hadn't seen in over a century. Yet for all of those legendary performances, what is there to really show for it? Nothing. They were fucking wasted. At least Mike Trout was taken out by injury so we could be spared from being a show pony, but it just leaves me absolutely infuriated with the Angels. This team can do little right. And at all points to the meddling bastard up top. What has been the issue plaguing the Angels the past few years? Terrible pitching and an over-reliance on one-year experiments. What did them in this season? Terrible pitching and an over-reliance on one-year experiments. Such things happen when you splurge on elite talents but are too spendthrift to go past the luxury tax threshold. You can draft pitchers with every single pick you have, but the only thing their minor league system is developing properly are whistleblowers. The Angels should be so much better than what they are, yet they keep castrating themselves thanks to executive meddling. It's frustrating to watch as a fan of the game. As they try to get Shohei extended, I can see Artie Moreno doing outright ridiculous things to fix the pitching issues. Like, say, signing Max Scherzer to a six-year contract. Don't laugh, he will do it! Things seemed really suspect about them throughout the year. The A's were good, but never had the X-Factors that would have made them a strong threat for contention. They felt like they were kind of there. They'd have moments of sheer brilliance, but never enough to stay consistent. It felt like they were going to fall off some time. All we had to do was wait until August for that. Once that month hit, everything went to shit, especially in the pitching department. That team ERA in September? No way you survived that if you want to advance further. They needed a team performance to hang on, and they didn't get it. Despite all of this bullshit, do you know the one thing that could have saved them? Beat Seattle. That's it, just beat the fucking Mariners and it could have extended their season. If they finish with a record over 500 against them on the year, they're tied for a wildcard spot. Typical Oakland failure. Speaking of Oakland, has anyone heard anything more about the Howard Terminal plan? All I'm seeing is of late are bureaucratic roadblocks in the way. The A's are just looking for an excuse to pack up and leave town at this point. You considering the god-awful attendance figures at the end of the season? They might have a spark to light that fire. Bob Melvin seemed to have gotten a head start on it and took a trip down I-5 to San Diego. You still care for the A's in Oakland? Hold on to something. It's probably gonna get a lot uglier than this. How the hell is this happening? Despite terrible underlying metrics, a god-awful run differential, everything smacking us in the face saying that Seattle should be terrible, the Mariners are thriving! They're finding amazing ways to win games. And hope has sprung anew in the Emerald City. Things have gotten so chaotic that they're tied for the second wildcard heading into the final weekend of the season. Imagine the meltdowns if the Mariners somehow make it in. You already know what happens. <laughs> They're gonna get in the ball. <laughs> oh, <my ball. laughs>
Yes, I am being hyperbolic, thank you very much. It's more like a ball tap, if anything. Did anyone even expect Seattle to be in that position? With how terrible their hitting had been all year? Jesus, this was an impressive season for a team that needed a jolt. And they did it with Chaos Ball, a fun differential, Chris Flexen, and Paul Sewold. Yeah, despite my feelings on them, I'm still reserved on the long-term outlook. Seattle has had these kinds of strong seasons before, only to outright shit the bed and implode the year after. Anyone remember the outcomes in 2008, 2010, 2015, and 2019? Maybe this team is different, but they need to show me that more than two hitters can do something at the plate at a given time. They have potential, but next year is the true test. I'm still proud of them, though. Their only claim to relevance this season was opening up to full capacity in time for their home opener. Just like that action, it merely inflated attendance figures to pretend that everything is fine and dandy. Texas is becoming more and more forgettable as time passes. It's not even the standard mediocrity that's plagued them in past seasons. When they're trotting out lineups this bad, they don't even have a chance. Yippee, the Rangers finally didn't fuck up a deadline by demanding the moon for prospects. So what? When are you firing John Daniels? He's accomplished nothing for years, yet he still has autonomy? I wish I could get rewarded for this kind of failure. I'm honestly jealous. Maybe stumbling on Adolis Garcia after they DFA'd him bought John another decade. They're probably going to be active in free agency, I reckon. Did they channel the spirit of Tom Hicks and massively overpay a few people? I hope so. What the fuck? I don't understand the Marlins. Nothing about what they are, but it's rare that I see a team seemingly just... give up. I get the season was a massive disappointment, but to watch them fall apart after July? Felt like a sequel to Bad News Bears at the plate and in the field. The last two months of the season were just embarrassing to anyone that witnessed it. The Marlins were experimenting in all the wrong ways. Jorge Alfaro in left field? Ragdolling the win Diaz between AAA and the majors? The lineups they were throwing out some games? They were just going through the motions. Miami's problem now is that they have the exact opposite issue they had in 2017. Unlike then, their pitching is elite. Some of the most underrated names in the game play here. Great starting rotation, strong bullpen, and dudes going from terrible in AAA to quality starter in the bigs. On the other side, deep shit. They're having serious trouble developing hitters. Most of their heralded prospects haven't panned out whatsoever. It's one thing to struggle, but a good chunk of them look completely overmatched. And with the Marlins staying the course, you need to start seeing some sort of progress on that front. If not, they'll eventually be doing the same shit they did in 2018. Selling off pieces to rebuild yet again. The New York Mets were record setters this season. They are the first team in baseball history to lead their division for over 100 days, yet finish with a record under 500. That's the kind of honor that should be boasted about for generations to come. Low Mets seems to have the same sort of staying power. I seriously believe the golden age of Mets comedy had come to a close. The more coupon family undermining everything replaced by an owner willing to spend. All that got them is a mere delay of the perennial crumbling. It happened in August instead of June. They bought two whole months of hope, despite the injury gods continuing to show no mercy on their players. You just had this weird despair and awe at you when Jacob deGrom was out with injury. That was the one straw that couldn't break and it symbolically shattered the team. 2021 is probably down there with 1993 and 2007 in some ways. Not in magnitude, but because it was supposed to be the start of a new era. And all they got was the same old shit. Luis Rojas, for as overmatched as he was, became the convenient scapegoat for organizational failure. Goodbye, placeholder! So now what? You go out and grab Carlos Beltran again because nobody cares about trash cans anymore? It's early November and the Mets still haven't found a new head of Team Ops nor a manager yet. Billy Bean wants nothing to do with this mess. Neither does Theo Epstein. Even Matt Arnold is being denied an interview by the Brew Crew. The Orange and Blue is still toxic and landmines are abound. If they're lucky, their new hires won't try to send unsolicited dick pics or get arrested for DUI. Time for a harsh lesson in life. It's not always about the money, Cohen. It's about Low Mets, baby. Let's go, Low Mets. Give it up for Low Mets. No way! Holy shit, Philly! You finally finished with a record over 500. Everyone, let's cheer. We need to give this team the keys to the fucking city. Spending hundreds of millions of dollars on players, a much-hyped farm system, a reputable manager, and buying at the deadline got them to the promised land of 82 wins. Oh, glorious day. What the hell is wrong with you, Phillies? Look at the year Bryce Harper had and tell me that was worth pissing away. Do you look him in the eyes and say, yes, Bryce, our bullpen is quite terrible again. The bats we have are extremely inconsistent. 
The team as a whole is systemically flawed and might need to be torn down as it doesn't have enough to do anything at this level. Their response tells me more than words ever could. No, we don't need to do anything drastic. Just fire a few underlings instead of address the real issues on the team. That'll keep the agony rolling along just fine. The Phillies are like an old 80s sports car. It looks sexy, the exterior's nice and polished up, the seats are retrimmed. And then you try to drive it and the clutch is busted, the transmission's shot, it's rusting on the inside and the battery's corroded. That's Philadelphia. I wonder who wins in the offseason financial battle. Free spending Dave Dombrowski or an ownership group tired of spending? I think Dave's got some more tricks up his sleeve there. The more I think about it, the more the 2019 Nationals team seem more like a fluke than a sustainable trend. This past year confirmed those fears. After a disastrous 2020, they bolstered the lineup with good depth to try and get back to the postseason. It did not work out that way. Washington was gerrymandered to hell and back by means of underperformance and their own limitations. And as a result, they had to use the nuclear codes. The faces of their franchise, Max Scherzer and Trey Turner, traded to LA for prospects. This is a sad time for DC, but it had to be done. There was no way the Nationals were going to be competitive and they need to start looking long term again. Even with their World Series, I still find it to be an insanely underwhelming era. They should have had far more than one shot at a championship instead of flaming out in the NLDS most years. It's not all terrible, Juan Soto is still around to kick ass, but the Nats are about to enter a hard reset. The next few years might be pretty rough. I trust Mike Rizzo to do the right thing though. He's earned that privilege from me. Seeing the Cubs like this should fill me with glee. With how much resentment I've had over petty transgressions like plantar fasciitis gate in 2015, I should be dancing on their grave as the lovable loser's image peeled off them like an old sticker. But despite past hatred, I feel nothing. In fact, I pity them in a way. Even for all the shit I've given them the past few years, watching the Cubs feels like a lost era. They have their championship, but this team had the potential to be a dynasty with the young talent they had. Since that World Series, it's been woeful underachieving to the highest degree. Great teams that fell apart at the worst moment. In honor of those lost seasons, they started out strong into May, then fell apart at the worst possible moment. Before the trade deadline. With massive payouts due for their stars, July 31st will now be known as Black Saturday. The majority of their core was dismantled. They might have gotten good returns, but it's undeniable. An era is over. And all that's left are ashes and remnants of that time. As they enter another rebuild, I only offer these words of comfort. Hey Chicago, what do you say? The Golden Core is gone today. Cling on to that trophy with all your might, Chicago. There's a good chance the L's gonna be flying high over Wrigley for quite a bit. This question has been asked for a few months by me now, and it still hasn't been answered properly by the Reds. What are they? Cincinnati has talent. Winker, Castellanos, and Jonathan India are treasures to boast about. Joey Votto turning the clock back years with a legendary performance? A wildcard spot was right for the taking, especially with their form into August. Dear God, it should have been easy, but since he always finds a way to turn their dream into a fucking nightmare. Whenever you expect this team to do anything, they fall apart. The Reds are way too unreliable to depend on. And this season showed why. This team is the Arizona Cardinals of baseball. And before you say anything, it's not this year's Cardinals they're imitating. It's the 2020 Cardinals. The group that was insanely inconsistent in nearly every aspect from game to game? That's Cincinnati. It may be ignorant for me to say to Reds fans, but I still believe last year was their shot. It's not just the team believing that everything's fine and keeping David Bell around, it's in Nick Castellanos. Let's just say there's a good chance he's going to opt out of his contract with the season he had. Do you seriously believe ownership is going to plunk down the money needed to keep him around? They can pretend their fade out in September is justification for not doing so. They have enough money trapped in players who have been poor performers. I have no faith in their efforts, as there's a drive into deep left by Castellanos and that'll be a home run. And so that'll make it a fort. The enemies of Pirates baseball are as follows. Kevin McClatchy, Dave Littlefield, Jerry Meals, the wildcard game, and first base. Something about that goddamn base traumatizes the team. Players miss it on home runs, coaches steal it, and there was this play. Jesus Christ, this play is going to be immortalized in the halls of memedom for generations to come. It's that beautifully awful from start to finish. It was a tank year tried and true, and the Pirates dismantled everything down to the screws holding the damn team together. Despite how bad this year was for the big league club, they have a rich prospect system again, but most of the good ones are in double A or lower. Next year is probably going to be more of the same. 
I will now build my shrines to Oransi Contreras and O'Neill Cruz as they will lead us to the promised land. I have some comforting news to tell you, Diamondbacks fans. If you eliminate their historically awful 5 and 40 stretch this season, they'd still be absolutely terrible. Am I in Joplin, Missouri? It's like a tornado ravaged the franchise and we've spent months trying to pick up the pieces. Arizona was as disorganized and out of place as Cattell Marte in center field. A team destined for mediocrity had everything fall apart in front of them. Mike Hazen, you can't even bitch at since he's taken a leave of absence to be with family in their time of need. I don't know if I agree with it, but they're treating this season as an aberration. It may have been record-setting and ineptitude, but just wash it off and blame everything on fluke circumstances. Nothing they did was wrong, it was just fate. The Diamondbacks are choosing to keep their heads in the sand instead of realize that their directionless attitude caused this implosion. No major changes in the managerial or executive branches. In a way, it's noble, but do you really see this team being able to do anything of note after the year they just had? Next year is a new year, but they need to shit or get off the pot. The D-backs can't keep doing what they're doing. It's not going to lead to any notable success. The Rockies are a joke of a franchise and should be mocked for their ineptitude until the heat death of the earth. When a franchise-killing move of trading away Nolan Arenado and giving a team $50 million just to take his contract isn't enough? That's a special talent. The fans didn't even get a chance to see Jeff Bradich publicly hung for his crimes against quality baseball as he was allowed to escape out of a secret passageway. But then, even then, this year couldn't be one of standard drifting. Colorado had a chance to reload with good returns on Trevor Story, John Gray, and many others at the deadline. Did their controller disconnect or something? They did absolutely nothing! They were so afraid of more backlash that they shit themselves instead of doing the right thing. Wow, boys, you managed to secure a few more meaningless wins by keeping them all around. A++ performance! Mission accomplished! This calls for celebration! An organization reeking of stale piss and rotting flesh chose to reward the temporary placeholder by making him permanent GM. Because keeping a guy that marinated in the same failure that Breidich did before him is organizational progress, right? But wait a second, I've been proven wrong. The Rockies managed to re-up their starting pitcher and power bat due to it free agency! No, not those guys, they're Chinese knockoffs! Antonio Senzatella and CJ Crone. If you're lucky, Brendan Rodgers' second half performance will last a few more years before he's gone too. Bottoms up, Denver! Absolutely pathetic. All the shit their fans talked. World Series ambitions. Rivaling the Dodgers in strength. What was it all for? Another off-season champions banner? All of the moves they made over the past few years and they couldn't even finish above 500. This was a group fighting for their division just a few months ago, for fuck's sake! But after the trade deadline? Jesus Christ! This was a collapse for the ages! One that rivals the 2011 Red Sox, the 2007 Mets, and the 1995 Angels in its scope. This year was eons worse for the Padres than 2015. At least that team just sucked! This group was so much more than that one in terms of talent and performance, yet they cratered like a fucking disaster movie! And by the time they realized they were in one, it was far too late. Fire Larry Rothschild as often as you want, it's not going to save the pitching staff from injuries or regression. They lost out on Max Scherzer at the deadline and had to rush to Goodwill in a panic. They came out of the thrift shop with pitchers like Jake Garrietta, Vince Velasquez, and Ross Detweiler. That's excusable, but why did the hitting go to shit? Why are there cracks showing in the dugout? It was such a fucking shit show that it made every other implosion seem tame in comparison. Jace Tingler was obviously overmatched as an extension of A.J. Preller and was justifiably chucked off the Coronado Bridge, but what about Preller? He's been at the helm for two all-in seasons that have blown up in his face. Why is he getting another chance? All he's done are big splash moves and create a cult of personality in the organization by hiring a bunch of yes-men. San Diego did bring in a veteran skipper and Bob Melvin to right the ship and bring stability to the locker room, but is he going to tolerate any potential of Preller's micromanaging? You may end up creating more fireworks if Preller doesn't change. And I just don't know if you'll get that from him. Never talk to me again unless you stay consistent, Padres. Now beat it! And that, my friends, is the end of the 2021 MLB season. There were highs, there were lows, and there were shit even lower than that, but I'd say it had a happy ending for most of America. The Atlanta Braves did it. I didn't think they could, I'm impressed. They did it without arguably their best hitter or pitcher in tow. And all of the feel-good stories. Ryan Snicker after his years of service to the team. Freddie Freeman solidifying his legacy in Atlanta. The rallying cry of the deadline acquisitions. Tyler Matzik going from being unable to throw a baseball to being one of the most reliable bullpen arms on the team. 
And most importantly, Ron Washington got the final strike. He won his first championship. It was a team of destiny, and I'm glad they were able to do it. They broke the curse of Atlanta. A city that needed something good to happen got it. Now I only hope that this isn't the last bit of baseball we get for a while. The upcoming CBA negotiations are going to be a rough battle. Buckle up. And the Braves lead 3-0 here in the third. Too many breaking balls, Joe. He was timing them up. And he got one that 